things are a little difficult, so if you want to go ahead and pop the top on the paper.
Keep the early loving feeling alive longer was the recommendation of the author. She, while living with her boyfriend now, is excited about the prospects of that in her life should she choose to marry someday. She writes in comparing these couples to those separated by long distance. Long distance couples ideal, idealize their partners more. They see their partners in unrealistically positive terms, which is generally a good thing. They also spend more time reminiscing or daydreaming about their relationships and report more romantic feelings for their partners. These effects are actually more pronounced the less face-to-face -face time the couples spend together. <laughs> it seems that absence really can make the heart grow fonder. If so, living apart may be one way, a gentler way, to reap some of these same benefits. And she went on to say in another benefit, of being a lap couple is unlike married couples who live, in, who live together, ending the relationship is easier because they already have a life away from the spouse. The author here is describing what happens when couples have romantic passion and attraction but not intimacy. You see, getting together for a night of passion occasionally is not intimacy. Intimacy develops out of the daily choice to remain intimately connected to each other and to work as a team in overcoming the challenges of life, as well as building a relationship worthy of passing on to the children. So the issue here is intimacy or the lack of intimacy. Now, that's funny. We all have fun with that. You know, nowadays people are trying to so the idea of you're going to be happier if y'all just live apart, um, to me, it's just totally nonsensical. Now, I understand what they're trying to say, but you can't build a marriage like that. But let me ask you this. Do you think people ever try to have a lat relationship with God?
And I promise you, if you have a lack relationship with God, you'll never be satisfied. You may have um, positive encounters. Now, I know people who are basically lack because I know they're locked away from church. But then on a Sunday morning, they go to churches where they got the music that's just right, and they woo, have an encounter with God. And then when it's over, check y'all next week. I'm going back to my life. That's what Okay? So John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. And the word for true there means the genuine article. In other words, there are false vines out there. There are vines out there that claim to be the true vine, but there's only one. The genuine vine is Jesus. And my father is the gardener. Now, aren't you glad our, the gardener is a father? Amen. I'd much rather the father be doing the, the pruning than the judge. Amen. Yes. Because the father's going to do what's best for us, even though it may not seem like it at the time. He And, and so verse uh, <clears throat> 2, he cuts off, oh, that hurts. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Ooh. Now, we're, sticking, we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. He cuts off. The word for cuts off means he takes it away or lifts it up. He takes it away or he lifts it up. What? Every branch that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit gets a pass. <laughs> while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And that's where that word he repeatedly prunes comes into play. So that it will be even more fruitful. Now, I know everyone experiences pruning or God requiring that we remove things from our lives that hinder faith, fruitfulness. God's going to do it. Now, if you're in a lack relationship with him, he does it. Because just about the time he starts pulling out the pruning shears, you're gone. Back to my life. But if you're in a real relationship with God, if, you, if you're going for intimacy... There's going to be times God's going to point things out and say, that's got to go. And that's usually when we come up with all the reasons why that doesn't apply to us. God got it wrong. I have reasons. Or best of all, I rebuke you, devil, in Jesus. But God won't let up. Now, what makes it even more difficult is when he's taking things out of our lives that he's not taking out of the lives of others. Don't you just love that? I'll pick a silly. So this may have happened to somebody. I don't know it did, but I'm going to pick a silly. Uh, God tells you, I do not want you to drink any more Cokes. What? What do you mean I can't drink any more Coke? I said, I don't want you drinking any more Cokes. And to know to do right and not do it is what? Sin. Sin. So God said, in your life, if you disobey me and drink Coke, that's a sin. Well, what's the first thing we do? That's not fair. That's not fair. It's not fair that I can't drink I love Coke. I, I don't really, but I love Coke. I, I can't. This, this isn't fair, God. I mean, my goodness, this cross is getting too heavy to bear. I said, I don't want you drinking Coke. Well, what happens then? If we can't get in alignment with that, we start looking at everybody who's drinking Coke. Oh, uh, mm-hmm. I saw Stanley over there the other day. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. He just, he thought I didn't notice him, but I noticed him when he was getting that Coke out of that drink box. 
always knew he wasn't right with the Lord. <laughs> it was about <laughs> Always knew he wasn't right. He's just pretending. And if somebody said, well, why do you think he's pretending? He's drinking coke. And usually when those type of things come up, people look at you and you're like, what? <laughs> I said he's drinking coke. That means he's lost. <laughs> no. He cuts off everything in our life that's going to prevent maximum fruit. And those things, and, and it's easy to pick out sins, you know, because we automatically, oh, well, that's sin, yeah, that, that, that. But what about the things that aren't sin? But we've allowed them to become attached to us, to, to get our attention. Maybe they just become sinful to us. Dare I say football? <laughs> Hey now, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, <laughs> or donuts. I can't tell you how many times last week I wanted to go by Wallace. I mean, Krispy Kreme's too hard to get in and out of there. As long as they stay like that, I'm good with Krispy Kreme. But Wallace, they're hard too, but boy, they work. I can't tell you how many mornings I got up love to go by the Lord's thing and get me a box of donut holes. And that little voice will say, Mama. Mm -hmm. Now, am I saying anybody goes to the Lord's is sinful? No. I'm just saying, I don't need to be doing that. You see, there's sometimes God's cutting things out of our life and demanding things be cut out of our life. Because he understands what it's doing to us. We don't. Because many times these things that we that he's cutting out are things everyone else is doing. And yet God says, for you, this isn't going to work. It's got to go. So he cuts out every branch that bears no fruit. Now, we're not talking about branches right there so much. We're talking more about the fruit. And he cuts away everything that gets in the way of our fruitfulness. So here's a big question. What is fruitfulness? What are we referring to here? Well, probably if you, if you read in the Bible, you'll find most of the time when you're talking about fruit, you're talking about the what's produced in a person's life that gives evidence to the nature of the person. Okay? So it's, it's like in nature. If I say I've got apple trees, but all you see are oranges, are you going to believe me when I say I have apple trees? No, you're going to look at the fruit and say, well, that's not apple, that's not apple, that's not. It, all I see is oranges. You've got orange trees. Well, the same is true with us. Now, when I, when I say that, don't, don't start thinking in terms of, well, that means that there's just one sin in my life, that I'm a bad tree, I'm a all this other stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when, when we tell people we are, are, are uh, disciples of Christ, but there's no evidence of it. There's none. Now, and, and we're not talking about a mixture of good and bad. There's none. We're claiming to be apple trees, but all we're producing is oranges. Well, that's a dead brain. For many of us, that isn't the case because we are producing fruit in our lives that does give evidence to the fact that we belong to Jesus. But sometimes all the fruit's not good. Sometimes there may be a mixture of good and bad. It's still all the same fruit, but it has to do with the quality of the fruit. Does that make sense? It's like the fig tree I mentioned to you a while back that was in our yard. It produced there weren't any apples produced on the feed tree. It produced consistent with the nature of the tree. But some of the figs were not good. There were some good limbs. 
There were some not so good limbs. What happened? The not so good limbs had disease in them. And if I'd been like God and been a vine dresser, I would have gone out there long before and cut those out. But I wasn't. Because I don't like figs and I could care less. But now my parents love figs and they used to come over and they would have to pick around the tree to find the good ones and leave the bad ones. So what's the remedy for that? The remedy for that would be to prune it, which happened. I told you about the guy who came from Auburn and in exchange for saplings, he would trip, uh, prune it back properly. And he did. And the next year we just had it. Good figs all over the place. Again, I don't like them, so I didn't care. But my parents loved it because there was more figs than we'd ever seen before, and they were all good. Why? Because in his pruning, he cut all those old dead branches and diseased branches out. He didn't prune them, he removed them. He pruned the good, removed the bad. Now that's what we're talking about here. So, what is the solution? What, how do we become these branches that Jesus said we are and be the kind of branches that bear fruit? Well, look in verse 3. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. And he's talking to the disciples here. I wonder if when he said this, if, he was, if the disciples were looking around and saying, is he saying we're bad fruit? Is he saying we're dead branches? What's going on here? We know the disciples were not the smartest guys. They were not the sharpest knives in the drawer. And so many times Jesus would say something, they go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and we're told in Scripture they didn't figure it out till later. So right then, they were probably asking, are, are, are we these dead branches? No, guys. You're already clean. We're already pruning you. Now, the word clean here is the same word for pruning. It, and it's the same thing. We're, we've already, we're pruning you. You're being pruned right now and don't even know it. How? Because you're being pruned by the word I'm speaking to you. Every day, Jesus was pruning them. Well, what did Jesus say then is the key? Verse 4. The NIV says remain. Some, verse, some versions say abide. I like to use the picture, though, of make your dwelling. Build your house. Where do you want to build? I'm going to build it in Jesus. I'm not moving. I'm going I'm to build my house in Jesus, and I'm staying there. So remain in me as I remain. Sounds like a pretty steady neighborhood. I got my house built in Jesus and he built his house in me. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now notice in verse 5, he, he goes back and he repeats this. I am the true vine. I am the genuine thing. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear fruit. You will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay? So, again, he, he repeats himself, I'm the vine. The point is, the repeating a phrase like this in the same uh, collection of verses was done for emphasis. Get this, guys. I'm the vine. Judaism isn't. What you've known all your life isn't. I'm the vine, and you are the branches. Now, if you remain in me, and I remain in you, you might bear some fruit. You will bear fruit. In other words, you're going to produce evidence of the fact you're mine. We call that 
fruits of the Spirit. When you look at that list of fruits of the Spirit, I've heard people do this before. They well intentioned. I'm not saying they were anything bad or wrong about it, at least in what they were wanting to do, even though the way they were going about it wasn't right. But they would look at the fruits of the Spirit and they'd make it a list. And they'd go down the list. Well, I'm doing okay on that one. Ooh, that one. Mm, I'm bad off on that one. Ah, uh, so so on that one. Let's see. This week I need to work on this one. Now, is that a fruit then? No, it's a goal. Okay? And, and so what happens when we take fruits and make them goals, we fail. Does that make sense? Yes. Because a fruit is produced naturally. A fruit, a, a plant doesn't strive in saying, I'm going to produce this I'm going to produce this feed. I'm going to produce this feed if it kills me. No. I don't know all the process, but I know uh, pollination occurred in that feed tree at some point. And when it did, automatically these little buds just started popping up. Because the natural process of, of, of pollination is to produce life. And you see, the relationship God's called us to isn't a lat relationship. It's a relationship of union and intimacy. And out of that union and intimacy, life will be produced. Fruit will be produced. It happens automatically. In fact, many times we don't even realize it. It's when people come up to you and something, maybe something happens and they come up to you and say, I just got to know what it is about you. You're different. You're, you're not falling apart like I'm falling apart over here. What, what is it? I've noticed all this time you're a certain way. What is it about you? What are they saying? I see your fruit. You may not know they're seeing it. You may not even know you have it. But they see it. <clears throat> Far apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, let's play with that one just a little bit. When he says you can do nothing, he's referring here to that fruit that God desires. Okay? The fruit given evidence that we're his. But how many of us will be honest enough to admit, apart from Christ, we can do some things? We can make a mess. We can fake it. You ever know anybody who faked it? On, tried to fake it on fruit? We call that being religious. And they create this image of, uh, I'm just got it all together. I just, I'm hoping, I wish you had it together as much as I had it together. <clears throat> and as long as they're in a controlled environment, they can hold it together for a while. But then when you talk to their kids, you find out they're nothing like that at all. So there are some things we can do, but one thing we can't do is produce the kind of fruit that God desires. Well, verse 6. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Now, when people like to interpret this passage in the framework of lost versus saved, They'll say, well, that means uh, God's going to send you to hell. Well, actually, that, of course, lost people go to hell. But actually, in the context here, what he's referring to is the dead branches that came off of the vines were only useful for one thing, starting fires. They burned hot. They burned quick. And so people would save these dead branches and when they needed a bonfire at night, they would just throw them out there and, and get them going. And once you got them going, you had a good fire going. But they didn't last. They burned quick. So what is Jesus saying here? If you do not remain in me, you are like branches that are thrown away and withers. Now, is he talking about salvation here? I don't think so. And in fact, um, some scholars believe this whole passage 
where he's talking about good branch versus bad branch, he's actually doing a contrast between uh, the Judaism they came out of versus what he's doing. And, and if that's true, then that certainly fits here. But I want to make it a little more personal for us. If we have a lap relationship with God, it's only going to be a matter of time that not only will we not be producing fruit, but our old nature is going to reassert itself and take over. Now, I think, and I think that's one reason why we have the two words for lifts up. One is takes away, the other is lifts up. We know common practice in that day was if uh, the farmer saw they had a limb that was weak, a branch that was weak and laid on the ground, he would pick it up and he would tie it off to a stronger branch. And he would leave it there until that branch was strong enough to take care for itself. So what we, what I'm saying here is I think sometimes if people do have a lack relationship with God, God deals with them about that for a season. And maybe he joins them with other people who, who are stronger in the Lord and, and can help them deal with this in their lives and, and he brings them into their lives for a season but then there's going to come a time that if they keep rejecting, rejecting, rejecting rejecting, God says enough now when he says enough, what happens? well Paul said that when people are in that state where they shipwreck their faith they're no longer useful God puts them on the shelf and so what, what, how would we make that work here? It would work like this. Sometimes people get to the point where they've rejected Christ. Maybe God's been dealing with them about something in their life. They know the Lord, but they, they've allowed sin to get a foot all in their life. And now the old nature's taken over, and God keeps drawing them to himself. He's drawing them to himself and keeps doing it, keeps doing it. And they keep saying no, 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 no. Sometimes... Their version of being thrown in the fire is their last little bit of usefulness, which is what happened here. This is the last little bit of usefulness where these dead branches was thrown in the fire. Their last bit of usefulness is to become an example. This is what you don't want to do because they go up on the shelf and they stay there. And I'm going to tell you over time, there's been many a person who started out strong with the Lord, but something happened along the way. Maybe they got offended. Maybe they uh, allowed sin to come back into their life. Or something happened. They allowed the old sin nature to take over again. And it totally destroyed them. And even though God was drawing them back to himself, they never responded. There comes a point they just become an example of what you don't want to do. That was their last little bit of, use, of usefulness. Well, verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciple. So, I don't know about you, but I always jump to the middle of that verse where it says, ask whatever you wish and I will do it. That's the point I, that was part of the verse I like. And so that was one I used when I wanted something. And I said, Lord, uh, you know, I, I know I want it so bad, you must want me to have it. So I pray in Jesus' name, you'll give me that new motorcycle. Or you'll give me that new car. Or you'll give me some whatever. And because I, I know you've, you've got to want me to have as much as I want to have. So I'm claiming this verse. The only problem was I didn't claim the rest of the verse. I just claimed that part. Well, if you look at the rest of the verse, that promise is actually sandwiched in a bigger um, thought. So let's look at the bigger thought. He said, first of all, we have to remain in him. Right? 
So we have to re we have to put our dwelling in Him. That means we're not in a lap relationship with God. We're in an intimate, daily relationship with God, where we start out the day with, Lord, I choose today. I'm going to stay in constant contact with you. I'm going to stay in fellowship with you, period. And sometimes you have to do that until it becomes a habit. But he said, if you remain in me, but then he, he says something else. He, he says, and my word remains in you. Not myself. My word. You see, the word provides us parameters, guidelines. So that, that when we start praying for something, there are some things you don't even have to pray about. Lord, I'm so tired of Danita. She's getting on my nerves. I just pray you give me a new wife. I'm saving my, I, I, I can just skip that. Because <laughs> that's why God's not going to answer. You know? Uh, Lord, that neighbor of mine, I'm so tired of them dumping their garbage on my land. I just pray you'd kill them. Well, he's not going to answer that. You know, and so if we know his word, we know that there are some things we don't even have to pray about. Because they're automatically yes or no. I give you a yes, we'll make it positive. If you say, Lord, give me somebody to witness to today, you'll get it. So, if we remain in him, we, we've made our dwelling in him, he, his word is in us, and not only does it give us the parameters of what he'll do, it also continues to cleanse us and to, and to prune us. Guess what happens over time? Over time, our wishes become his wishes. Now, if you want to get your prayers answered, start praying his wishes rather than our wishes. And when we pray his wishes, we see things happen. You see, that's why Jesus spent so much of his time praying. Because he wanted to make sure in his humanness he was dialed in to the right channel. And all you older folks remember those old analog radios. I wish I still had one. I don't know what it is. I bought one at Woolworths. I still remember that as a boy. Three ninety nine. dollars I thought that was a fortune. All I could get was AM on it. And there was only two stations in Dothan that played AM. But if you would play with that dial, and if you didn't get it just right, you'd hear a bunch of static. You might hear some <laughs> muffled type stuff. It, it, and, and you just had to play with it to get it fine-tuned. But now if you got it fine-tuned, you could hear it perfect. That's what prayer is. It's getting the dial fine-tuned on God's station. So he's, he, goes, he says, so if you, are, if you ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you, when or why? Because this is to my Father's glory. That you bear much fruit. What's to his Lord? That's the kind of prayers he's going to answer. Or those prayers we pray. And we say, God, I want to pray your will. Show me what your will is in this situation. And we start following his will instead of our own. And the more we're fellowshipping with him, the more he's changing us. And as that's taking place, our will changes. Our approach to life changes. We become less selfish as we're becoming more like him. And as we get focused in then on how he wants us to pray, we can pray what he would want us to pray. It's going to happen. And then Jesus said, and he's going to do all of this because it's going to contribute to the fruit production. Now, how is that possible? It's possible because of the new covenant that Jesus made available to us through the cross. Through his blood, through his body, he made possible that we don't have to settle for a lap relationship with him. 
that we can have an intimate relationship with him and we can be transformed by him. And that's why we celebrate communion. So if you would take your piece of bread, we can call it that. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your body. Thank you, Lord, that it's by your stripes we are healed. So, Lord, as we partake of this uh, bread, help us, Father, to remember that it's your body that was broken for us. And it's because of that we can be made right with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for the blood. We know it's the blood that cleanses from sin, and we know it's uh, the blood that's made this new covenant possible. So, Lord, we, we pray as we uh, drink this juice that it won't just be juice, but it'll remind us of the high price that was paid for our Lord. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death to the cross. So my friends, I encourage you this week to take stock of your relationship with God. Are you on the path of intimacy? Or have you settled for a lack relationship? I can assure you, the path of intimacy is the only one where you will be fulfilled in this journey. So I pray, I pray for all of us that we won't settle for less than the best. Father, I do pray for each person here today, and I pray, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts today about the, the fact that we can be fruitful. And we can give evidence that we belong to you, but it's not going to happen if we settle for a lat relationship. It only happens when we remain in you. And Lord, I know we remain in you as for our salvation, but Father, help us see that we also have to remain in you for our fellowship and for our intimacy that brings about transformation. And Lord, as, as this takes place, Thank you that you promised that we will be fruitful. And you promised that when we pray according to your will, you will answer. So, Lord, I pray for each person this week that they'll prosper and be in health as their souls prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, remember, Chuck is with us next week. Have a blessed week.